I am Bill Hamrick. I'm the uh, executive officer of the Colorado Livestock Association. We're located in Greeley, Colorado, and have been there for about 14 years now. Uh, I think there's a certain unique quality to our membership organization, and that is that we represent a variety of species. Uh, we have most major components of the beef industry, uh, dairy, swine, sheep. Uh, at times in the past, we've even had a poultry contingent uh, that was a member of the association. And in the past, we've also been approached by such diverse species as alpacas, uh, llamas, rabbits, uh, horses, uh, as, as becoming part of the association. And I think the, the driver uh, in, in that regard is that we focus only on those things that everybody connects with. And in two very, very specific areas, that is regulatory, which is what's kind of brought us here today, and legislative. And so if it doesn't deal with a, an issue that cuts across all of these species, we tend not to go there, or one, we defer to another organization who has that as part of their policy or part of their mission, or we simply collaborate with them in a supportive kind of a nature. And I think that that kind of speaks to the, to the overall culture of, of the foundation of this organization. And this morning I would like to, uh, I, I hope that this is germane to the title, a proactive partner in uh, addressing livestock ammonia. And as Jay and Phyllis have already pointed out to you here, uh, livestock agriculture is estimated, at least based on the O2 numbers, to contribute about uh, 37 to 40 percent of the ammonia problem in Colorado. The good news about that is, is when this first came to our attention as an association back in 2005, some of the preliminary modeling at that time indicated that livestock agriculture alone might be uh, responsible for somewhere between 75 and maybe 80 percent. So based on those numbers where we have, we have cut that number through research, through additional modeling, and through a number of other uh, exchanges to get it in more realistic picture, uh, I think there's some, we, we can take some uh, positive feelings from, from that. I want to talk about three things this morning. I want to talk about culture, I want to talk about trust, and I want to talk about commitment. And for those of you who are sitting here thinking, oh my God, I didn't think I signed up for a 12-step program, <laughs> don't worry, I, I, I'm not going to give you a life lesson here today that you can take out of the room and apply to your family or your business, but I'd like to talk about those three things and the role that they have played, uh, primarily this issue of nitrogen deposition in the park, but overall, the engagement of this association and our other uh, agricultural partners in the state of Colorado. Starting with culture, this organization is a successor of uh, the original Colorado Cattle Feeders Association, uh, which started out in 1955, and there are much, much older organizations across the country than that. So relatively speaking, this is a, a newbie, if you will, as far as membership organizations go. But about the time that uh, this organization came into existence, there were a group of visionary individuals that looked around at what was kind of going on in the world that we live in. And one of the things that they saw, amongst many, was that the permitting process from the regulatory side was becoming a real issue. And so, an, handful of uh, people approached our Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and asked about how would they go about getting a permit. And in this case, it was a discharge permit for feedlots and dairies. We had already gone through an arduous process related to the swine industry in this state, which I dare say even to this day is without question the most stringent regulations on any one livestock industry in the country. The dairy and the beef folks in this state, especially from the consignment confinement side of things, took, a, took heed to that and said, we don't need to go down that path. Let's get proactive. Let's approach the department and see what we can put together. And I wasn't around then, so I'm going to take some liberties with maybe what really happened. So don't hold me to this. But when they got there, 
they found out that at that time our Department of Public Health and Environment did not have a permit per se. So the gentlemen that were there that day said, that's fine, sometime in the next week or 10 days we'll be back and uh, we'll have a proposal. In the course of time there, what they did is probably went and took a look at what Texas had or what Kansas had at that time and kind of put together a, a fundamental rudimentary uh, permit. The message there for you is, is that right from the get-go in this organization, they were interested in being uh, at the table. Uh, they wanted to be part of the process. Uh, they wanted to establish some of the rules that were going to be uh, set forth that Phyllis has alluded here to this morning. And that, that attitude, that culture pervades uh, in the association today. I would like to say also, and not to be selfish or arrogant about this, but with, with our organization as kind of the leader in this area, I think also the other organizations that represent not just livestock agriculture, but crops as well, have come together in, in, a, in a more collaborative kind of a way. And Phyllis pointed out here this morning, the Rocky Mountain National Park Subcommittee. And back in five, six, along in that area, it, it became apparent that this was not an issue that was going to go away. It was real. And I, I was amazed at that time because if you go look at water quality issues, they probably got their legs back in the 60s, 70s, somewhere in there. And it, it kind of took us 20, 30, 40 years to get to where we are today. And I'd like to think, at least in this state, that water quality regulations tend to be uh, kind of mature, uh, where air really came out of nowhere in 04, 05, 06, and specifically with, the, uh, with our park up here, of which we consider it to be a real treasure in this state, and it, and it really galvanized people in a very quick way. So talking about culture, it's, it, we, don't, we don't dig our heels in. Yes, we push back at times, but we're, we're going to be engaged and we're going to be at the table. The second thing I mentioned to you is trust. And I think the word trust is bandied about in a relatively indiscriminate way at times, and it's nice to say it fits nice into a 20-minute presentation like here this morning. But we take trust in the Colorado Livestock Organization in a very, very serious way. It's trusting our members, them trusting us, trust amongst employees. And beyond that border, and I'm going to, to uh, give Phyllis Woodford some kudos here this morning, uh, she heads up our environmental ag program in this state. And that's another story, another presentation all in itself. But I remember 10 years ago or so, or maybe a little bit longer, when I came to know Phyllis and she was in a slightly different role than she is today, there were some people that said, you know, you've got to watch that Phyllis Woodford. And so I did. And it became apparent that they really didn't mean it the way they said it. Because I think Phyllis has proven in the, in the years since that she has been a great partner. And I don't mean to say that in a way that, that she looks the other way that she does not do her job, but she does it in a fair and trusting way. Uh, to put it kind of bluntly, we've never known her to lie to us, and I don't think we have ever lied to her or her associates either way. So I, I think as we go forward, not just in the Rocky Mountain National Park issue, but it, it goes beyond. It goes to the other MOU agencies that you saw up here, the uh, National Park Service and EPA, and, and I think back about when this first came up, and Jay touched on some of them this morning. You can't believe the number of things that popped up on the radar screen. The people said, how can that be? How can, how can winds blow stuff in the park when I know they come from the north? Well, typically they do. But as science has told us, and this is another trust factor, when you have good quality science that you can believe and trust in, it helps build your case. And thanks to Jay and a number of his associates at Colorado State University and some others, we have slowly and agonizingly developed that science over time, and hopefully we're going to continue to, to develop that kind of stuff because that'll be the underpinnings of a, of a continuing trusting relationship. The third thing is, is commitment. And I think from the get-go uh, on this issue with the park, that we made, a, we made a conscious decision in our organization that we were going to stay the course 
and be part of this process. And commitment, again, means different things to different people. Uh, the gentleman that you're going to hear from next here is, is one of those within our association who has made a significant commitment uh, to this issue in particular, but also to other things that he does on behalf of the, the, the association, its members, and even over all the citizens of Colorado. John initially served on the Air Quality Control Commission, uh, which really took a hold of this in its very early years. Uh, he has been a great ambassador, I think, for agriculture in that, in that area. He has since moved on uh, with a gubernatorial appointment to the Water Quality Control Commission. So he brings a great diversity of, uh, of uh, experience as relates to environmental regulations in the state of Colorado. Commitment comes in forms of time. It comes in, in forms of financial. And, and we're looking at Colorado State University. I was encouraged this morning, Jay pointed out that uh, he's got an additional grant that is going to speak to some of this early warning uh, stuff. We hope to be partners in ways other than, say, financial. I think we've got some members that are working very closely with Jay in letting him use their facilities uh, as testing ground, uh, something that I think maybe 25 years ago, even in this state, might not be, uh, might, might have been unheard of. And one of the reasons was is because you didn't have that trust, okay? There might have been that suspicion that Jay was out to get him or wanted to come up with that gotcha kind of an approach. So we're, we're willing to, to be at the table and, and be committed and be part of this process. So again, I hope that didn't come across as a 12 point or 12 step kind of a program. But if you, if, and, and I'm, I don't know most of you in this room here, but I would encourage you if you have a takeaway today, number one is to be involved and in whatever capacity, because not to get up on a political soapbox here, but resources are becoming very, very precious people's time, money, uh, what have you, and we're going to all have to work together in a more collaborative way. And I'd like to think that here in Colorado that uh, we have all rallied around this issue with the nitrification in, the, in Rocky Mountain National Park, and it has brought all of us, uh, all the MOU agencies, our, our department, our members, uh, and other constituents in the state together to, for a good cause. <clears throat> 